Hey, welcome back to our VR beginner series, where in the last couple of videos, we went over a lot of the plugins, we got our basic project set up, and we made sure that our tracking was working. Where all we did was throw an XR rig into the scene and hopefully it worked. And in this video, we're gonna be more or less deconstructing the XR rig and talking about the important components on it, as well as discussing some of the limitations that we have. And as of right now, your scene should look something like this. Very simple, all we have is a plane, our interaction manager that's added automatically when we create an XR rig, as well as the XR rig itself. So let's start by expanding the XR rigs hierarchy. You know, I thought that was gonna be a little bit more grandiose than I thought, let's click this one. <laughs> this, these are the objects that we're gonna be looking at in this video. But on our root object here, we have this component of type XR rig where we have all of these variables that are already set up for us. None of these we're gonna have to really mess with or anything like that, but depending upon what headset you're using, this may be a value to you. Where by default, the tracking origin mode is set to the floor. Now, what does that mean exactly? If you're using a headset like a Quest, a Rift, a Vive, or anything like that, it has tracking that establishes the floor plane. If you remember when you calibrate your headset, the software does its best job either automatically if you're on a quest to detect where the floor is, but you can also take your controllers and move it down to a floor to set it up manually. And this tracking mode is generally referring to headsets that have six degrees of freedom. So that accounts for both rotational tracking as well as positional tracking. And this is gonna to apply to pretty much all modern headsets. Um, most headsets that have three degrees of freedom that only have rotation, and that would be your Oculus Go, your Gear VR, your Google Cardboard, Unless you're in a learning setting, those headsets aren't used as much anymore. But let's say you are using one of those. The tracking mode that it uses is the device tracking, where this uses just a set position that you'll use manually, and then just uses the rotation values that it's going to get from the device itself. And that's where this camera Y offset comes into play, because like I said, if it just has rotational tracking, we need some way of manually setting it into the position that we want when our project starts. So what this camera Y offset will do is It'll take this game object here, and it'll move it up in space depending upon what that value is. But let's undo that. Like I said, it's just good to know about that. It's not something we're actually gonna really be using in this. We'll most likely just keep the settings like they are. But moving on, the big components of this is gonna be our camera and our controllers, obviously. And if we look at our camera, you'll see that it has a track pose driver. And this is what's ultimately gonna be getting the information from our backend and applying it to this camera. So it's gonna be getting that positional and that rotational information, and it's gonna be applying it to this game object. Now in here, it already has everything set up for us, but kinda of like how I talked about previously, it kinda of has a tracking type here, where as of right now, it's set to six degrees of freedom because it has rotation and position, but if we wanted to, we can have it as just position or rotation only. This same track pose driver can be used for controllers as well. And we can see that here, if we click into our device, we can see that we'll get a generic XR controller. But before we click that, you'll see that it also has a particular source for the information that it's gonna be getting. So right now it's set to the center eye of our headset or our head mounted display, what H and B stands for. And if we click here, we can have our separate eye sources, the head, as well as the color camera if your headset has one. But we don't need to worry about this, we're just gonna keep it on center eye. But the big thing is, if we change it from a generic XR device, which is usually a headset, to a controller, you'll see that it automatically changes this set of pose sources to either the left or the right controller. So this thing can universally be used for both the positional setting of the headset as well as the controllers. So let's set that back really quick. Obviously, we can't set it to the left eye or to the left controller, so let's set it to our center eye again. And that's all we need for that. But as a side note, if we wanted to create our own pose provider, we can overwrite some of this information. Again, we won't be doing that, but it's good to know. Let's select our left hand controller. And you'll see we have this XR controller here. And we also have this XR ray interactor, line renderer, and this line visual. We're not gonna be using that right now. We're not gonna be talking about it. We will be talking about interactors in the next video, but we specifically won't be using this one. So let's actually select both of our controllers here. And let's just remove these. So we'll just remove all of them. And I go from the bottom up here because they do require each other in a particular way. So if you try and remove one and it says, hey, this component depends on this one, just remove it in the order that I just did. Now let's look closer at our XR controller here. Now this does a lot for the XR toolkit. As you can tell, for one, it's going to be handling the tracking information. 
In the posing, much like this track pose driver does that I just showed you, that's incorporated into the XR controller and it also does our input for us. Now like everything in technology, nothing's perfect and we do have some limitations with the XR controller, particularly when it comes to input and the sort of actions that we can do. The good part about this is like if you're a bit more industrious, you can write your own XR controller. And what we're first going to be looking at is where we're going to be getting our information from. And that's going to be this controller node here, where it's currently set to the left hand. But if we click the drop down, we can see that we give very similar nodes or very similar values to what we got in that tracked pose driver component, where we have the different eyes, the center eye, the head, as well as these sort of hands which represent the controllers. And this is just the piece of information we're going to be asking for our input. So we're going to be asking the left hand for these different inputs that we have. Now it's default to for selecting an object, it's going to be the grip button. And then for activating it and pressing UI, it's going to be the trigger. Now the big thing to know about what each of these are, we'll, we'll go into them more once we start talking about interactables and interactors, but selecting an object ultimately means picking it up. And then deselecting it is dropping it. Activating it is a extra sort of interaction that you can do on an object that you're holding. So what we're going to be using it for is since we have a simple projectile launcher, we'll be picking it up using the select event and then we'll be firing it using this activate event. But taking a closer look at the input, you'll see that we have this drop down for what we can do. And this may look fine at first glance, but we are somewhat limited here. We have our trigger, our grip, our primary face buttons for our A and our B, as well as clicking down on some of our axes. And this is either going to be a touchpad or a joystick. But this doesn't really give us a ton of flexibility when it maybe comes to modern implementations of teleportation input and things like that, where you would usually press a joystick forward and then when it's released, that sort of behaves as your teleport begin and your teleport end. This doesn't support that. But for a simple project, this is pretty much exactly what we need. And other than that, we won't be messing with any of these settings. We're just going to keep them as the default. One thing extra to notice is that this access to press threshold, where on some of your inputs, it's not going to simply give you a true false value. Like on every controller, the trigger is going to give us a value and it's going to be a value between zero and one. But thing is, what is the threshold at which you want that press to go from false to true? And this is what this threshold does. With the value of 0.1, we basically say, let's once we've pulled about 10% of the trigger's full range of motion, let's set this to true. But we'll be leaving that like it is. We don't have to mess with that. What we will be doing is setting up some basic representation of our hands, and we'll be looking at this sort of model section here. And this is particularly useful because it's going to be integrated with some of the stuff we're going to be doing in the next video. And I wouldn't say this is a perfect solution if you want an incredibly like robust hand system, but this is really good for getting something up and running pretty quickly if you're looking for something representational. Or if you just have a basic hand that can open and close and then can change states based on whether you've selected an object or not. But we're just going to have spheres for hands, so we're not going to be messing with any animations. But let's do that really quick. Let's create a little hand prefab. So we'll come over to our hierarchy, we'll right click, we'll go to 3D object, and we'll just create a simple sphere here. Make sure I didn't accidentally add it to my hierarchy of our, my rig, I didn't. And let's make sure we just zero it out in the scene really quick. Now, as you can imagine, this sphere is probably a little bit too big for our hand. So what we're going to do is we're going to scale it down by 0.1 for all of our little values there. And then let's just double click it so we can zoom in. We'll zoom out a little bit and I'm going to turn off my gizmos because I usually keep those off. And then we'll rename this to hand. And this is just going to be a visual representation of our hand. We don't need any functionality on it. So we're going to be getting rid of this sphere collider as well. And with everything, we're going to need to start fleshing out our file structure as well. So we're going to have a very simple folder for our prefabs, our materials and our meshes and everything like that. So we'll just create a new folder and we'll just call this prefabs. We'll then be just dragging our hand into that folder and it's going to create a prefab for us. And if you're not super familiar with prefabs, they're super handy if you have multiple scenes and you want to make sure that all the objects across all of those scenes are consistent. Also that when you're making changes to it, you can easily apply those changes to all of those other instances of that object across your entire project. So I use them for almost everything and fairly frequently. But for this case, we're going to need one because if we go to our rig again, we'll expand it and make sure that we're selecting both of our controllers here. Well, actually we can't do that because we don't have multi-object editing. 
That's always wonderful. So let's select our left-handed controller and let's just drag this hand to this model prefab here. Well, actually, let's not do that. We need to grab this one here. That's usually a common mistake that I almost just made. You wanna make sure that we wanna be grabbing the prefab from our project window. So we'll drag it in there. We'll select our right-hand controller and then we'll drag this hand in there. One of the slightly misleading things I feel like is that it's a of type transform. I thought it would be a game object, I'm not sure why that is. But, and at this point we could delete this, but I'm gonna leave it there and we're actually gonna move it off to the side a little bit just so I can show you this. So let's move it over here and then let's hit play. And my window is currently in maximize mode, so let's disable that. And if we go to our scene, you'll see that we've created some spheres here that are currently childed to our hand that are a little bit bigger than the scale that we initially set. So if we go to these, our clone, the scale has been set to one when we initially had that prefab at 0.1. And that's because in the XR controller, when it instantiates the object, it's gonna set the scale of it as well. And this can happen if you're trying to scale your hands or something like that in scene rather than your import settings, which we'll talk about that more once we start importing assets, so don't worry about it. But what we're primarily gonna be kinda taking a look at is this model transform here. And if we select our controller again, you'll see that it's this model transform here. And if you remember, we didn't set this and it automatically did it for us. Where it just created this simple empty game object that our hand is being childed to. So let's stop playing and then we'll sort of set our own up and we'll talk about why that's important. Now, if we select that controller again, like I said, you'll see that we don't have a model transform here. And this is useful because whatever object we're instantiating for our hand is gonna be child to this. So if we wanna have our hands in a particular rotation to have a more natural state, but in our case, since we're using some very placeholder objects and we wanna manipulate the scale a little bit better, we can do that by manipulating the model transform. So what we can do is we can child an empty game object and create one manually. And this is something that the XR Toolkit does for a lot of the interactables, for attach points and things like that. And we'll be talking about attach points when we, once we start setting up our weapon and all that stuff. So we'll create an empty game object here and we'll just call it model transform. And what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna go to the scale here and we'll set this to 0 0.1. And this may be also the point, let's say if you had a hand that you wanted rotated by 45 degrees, you can come in here and just type in 45 just so it'll rotate when it's instantiated. So let's undo that. There we go. And then let's go to our left hand controller and then we're just gonna set that model transform right there. And then we're gonna duplicate this and we're going to child it to our right hand controller. And you can duplicate objects easily by selecting the object and just hitting control D. And it's just gonna create a duplicate for us. And then we'll click and we'll drag it. And I'm gonna get rid of this one here cause it's gonna bother me. And then we'll just set that on the right hand controller. There we go. And at this point, if we wanted to take more advantage of this system, we could have some transitions here for strings and an animator for our hand to change once we've selected an object. We won't be doing that, but maybe we can in the future, or we can create a basic hand or something like that. But everything's looking good. Let's go to our hand, and we'll actually set the scale of this back to one, just so you can see that we're going to be able to apply our changes to this prefab, and then so that our model transform looks like it's working correctly. So let's set this to one. And once you've made changes to a prefab, you'll see that we have this little blue line here. And then we'll go to this overrides dropdown and we can apply our changes. We can either revert them if we wanted to, in case you screwed something up and you wanna to go to the settings that are currently stored within your project window. But for this, we want this, so we'll just hit apply all. And then we can actually delete it out of our scene right now. So let's just save that and let's hit play again. And let's go to our scene view. And you'll see here, if we expand our model transforms, these are the model transforms that we created, that they're scaled, and our little hand prefab has been instantiated. All right, and that's actually it for our sort of scene work that we're gonna be doing in this video. Let's actually check to make sure that our tracking and our hand is all looking good in game. All right, and now we have working hand presence in our project. And not to get into it too much, since again, we will be covering it in the next video, it's sort of explaining why we went through this entire process. Well, this is going to make sure that we're tapping into a system for the interactors that we can hide the representation of our hand when we pick up an object. 
And this is just the simple concept of tomato presence, where we can use an inanimate object or the object that we picked up to represent our hand when it is not visible. And this is a good concept when you're prototyping, or maybe you don't have as much time for creating assets or something like that. I think it really gives you the opportunity to focus on your idea rather than worrying about a lot of the idiosyncrasies that comes with hands for posing and all that stuff. But that's it next week. If you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to leave them below and I'll see you in the next one.